Well, good morning, everyone. It's wonderful again to be in the house of the Lord. And uh, uh, I think we're going to just pick right up where we left off last Sunday. Just to give everybody a refresher, we're in Ephesians chapter 1, uh, reading 1 and 2. And we talked about who we are in Christ and knowing that there is a difference in people who are not in Christ and people who are in Christ. We talked about Paul and his uh, initial, uh, his uh, initiating this letter and how he writes it and how he starts to write it and made the comment, if I was in jail, never been in jail, you know, I, I, my letter would not even compare to his because his letter is uh, biblical canon. My letter would just be uh, a letter to you and whoever else wanted to listen. But it would be the fact of trying to understand the, the, the church of Ephesus just starting off and their their pastor, their their preacher, their you know uh, the man, their shepherd at that time it is now in jail again. And again is a key word here because that's what Paul usually ended up causing riots because he went against the grain of social uh, of society. He went against the grain of the culture. He called out people's sin and told them there was only one way to have your sin resolved, and that was through Jesus Christ. And then he uh, presented that to all the people, which people hang on to their idols, people hang on to their their livelihoods and so forth. They don't want to change. Mm -hmm. So what do they do? They retaliate, they lash out, and that's where all that happens. So we talked about uh, our position in Christ, being in Christ, uh, as we start and read Ephesians 1, 1 and 2, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ, grace to you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, he, he first off, he says, you know, when we go to the uh, latter part of uh, the first verse, it says, in Christ, there's two things there. We're saints and we're faithful. Now, a lot of people believe that sainthood is something that is needed uh, by action. It's something that is needed by um, by doing things, okay? I, I don't know if anybody else in the house other than myself uh, was in, and I can only speak to this because this is what, what I, uh, I used to follow, was Catholicism, okay, in the Catholic Church. I don't know if anybody else used to be a Catholic or, or, or still practice Catholicism to some degree, but my whole family uh, have always been in, in Catholic uh, houses and follow Catholicism, so that's a lot of knowledge that I have. And it's kind of it's kind of funny because I know when somebody that has never been here before that is from a Catholic church, they'll come up to me and say, Father Albert, um, what time does Mass start? So that all those words, all those, all those, you know, words are what I know. You look at them and say, um, no, Albert. You say Pastor Albert if you want, and uh, Mass. Okay, it, it's just a uh, it's just another word for saying our services. So, um, but growing up, of course, in the Catholic uh, Church, uh, I, I was in it for ten years, from kindergarten to ninth grade, uh, as an altar boy, as an altar boy, as uh, serving the church, helping the priests, and uh, understanding to some degree. Uh, about the saints and so forth that are in the Catholic Church. Now, when, when you're a young boy or a young girl and you might idolize something or idolize someone, you know, uh, sometimes I would you know, give, idolize maybe one of the saints that's in Catholicism, you know, like I was in St. Vitus. Um, kind of had maybe like a superhero type outlook on these individuals. And some of these individuals, you might say, this is Chastity Man as opposed to Aquaman or Superman. You know, Superman being my greatest fictitious uh, superhero, of course. And Aquaman having special abilities and special powers, just like Superman. You know, you might think that Chastity Man is somebody, super, super, some, some man who's able to keep his hands to himself, you know, and keep himself pure. So, you know, you, you have this, this sort of mentality. Um, but in all reality, the Catholic Church actually has uh, what's called nine steps 
in, in order for them to declare an individual a saint. So what we're talking about this morning is how Paul writes this letter to the church of Ephesus and he calls them saints. And that same letter applies to us, okay? So I'm just going by what I know. I'm not here to bash Catholicism. I'm not here to degrade Catholicism. I'm just here to talk about what I know the differences are. So we're looking at biblical sainthood versus man-made sainthood, okay? And again, I'm not belittling or bashing. I'm just using the information that I know, okay? So one of the first requirements of becoming a saint in Catholicism is you need to be Catholic. Well, that knocks me out right there. I'm not going to be a saint in Catholicism. I'm not Catholic anymore. I don't, I don't follow the Catholic uh, religion anymore. So that knocks out every Protestant in, in the world, okay? So the, the second, okay, requirement is you need to be dead. You need to die, okay? Well, that knocks out every living individual in the world forever becoming a saint, all right? So the third one, and, and this is where it gets complicated. This is where it gets really uh, in my opinion, unfortunately, uh, political. So number three, a local devotion grows up around your memory. So you die, and then people make a memorial. And they talk about you, and think about you, and honor you, and maybe start to venerate you. So you, you have a group of people that you've influenced, people that looked up to you, and they start... Uh, they start maybe praying to you. They start using your, your name in certain masses. Uh, and they start sort of lifting you up to some degree because of, to honor you because of your accomplishments that you have done for the church. Okay. Now, number four, your life is investigated. Okay. So you have guys with... Uh, that show up with clipboards. Uh, what was his or her life like? What did they do? What uh, did they not do? What kind of person were they truly like? And then a case is made. Okay? So somebody puts all of this in a folder. Okay? So as it's put in a folder, the next step, number five, it goes to the bishop. It goes to the local bishop. Now, the local bishop investigates the case for sainthood. And then it goes all the way to the Vatican. It goes to Rome. Guys with hats. Big hats. Fish-shaped big hats, okay? You can always tell who's in charge by the size of the hat, just to let you know. Okay. Number six. Then people start praying for a post-mortem miracle. That you would heal somebody or do something miraculous from heaven. That you would show up on earth through an answering of a prayer. So somebody gets healed in your name or some miracle happens in your honor. Number seven. Then the Vatican investigates the miracle. So the guys with the big, big hats. And the clipboards show up. They're trying to authenticate that a real miracle happened in the memory and honor of the individual that died that was a Catholic who they investigated. Now, if all of it is confirmed, then the eighth step is then they declare you blessed. We're going to look at that in verse 3 next week. Paul says... We're saints and blessed. So it doesn't take a huge committee to figure out that the blessing, that the blessing of God. But a committee comes together in the Catholic process and declares you blessed. So then people start praying for another miracle. This is number nine. You've got to do a lot of miracles here after you die. Okay, you got all that. So there's... A lot to be done. And then if any, and then if another miracle happens, 
to confirm your sainthood, they take a vote. You're a saint. The, the uh, uh, pontiff declares you a saint. That's it. Then you can be venerated. Then schools can be named after you. Churches can be named after you. You might even get a festival day like St. Patrick's Day. And so whatever your name is, it becomes the name of a school or a church or a festival or something else. And again, I'm not here to bash. I'm not here to degrade. I'm here to tell you what I know to inform you that there are man-made systems to clue to 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 uh, exalt or to honor people as saints. But that's not what I agree with. I, I agree with one thing. What is biblical sainthood? I want to know what the Word of God states is sainthood, not man. Now, Paul makes it really simple, doesn't he? It's almost too simple. One step no money, no committee, nobody with a clipboard, nobody with a hat. You don't have to die. You don't have to do a miracle. One thing. What is it? To be a saint, what's required? In Christ. Your identity is required. In Christ. In Jesus Christ. You are in Christ. If you are in Christ, you are a saint. Now, I know for some of uh, some people, maybe some of you right now, and I know definitely some people out in the world, that after they hear this, their mind's just going to go, I think there's an emoji for that. A little guy, the top of his head blows up. If I could put that up there on the screen right now, I would. You see, because you have thought that the more sinful I think I am, the closer to God I am. The more I focus on my sin, the more pleased God is with me. You see, God is not honored by self-esteem in the secular world, and God is not honored with self-condemnation in the spiritual world. God is honored when our thoughts and our focuses are primarily on Jesus Christ, His Son. There are many people in this world that go through life thinking, oh, I, 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 I've no, I've been... I became so much aware of my sin, now I'm getting closer to God because I'm so aware of my sin and I just want to make sure I focus on my sin because the more I focus on my sin, the more I get closer to God. Wrong. Nothing in Scripture proves that. Nothing in Scripture even states that. God is honored when our thoughts and our focuses are primary on Jesus Christ. That our identity is not a how much we love ourselves or how much we hate ourselves. But who he is and what he's done and what it means to be in Christ. I can't tell people, you and everyone else, enough. The Bible, the Holy Scriptures, the Word of God is about Jesus Christ, period. There's no questions about that. There's not going to even be a discussion about that. I'm not even going to come close to even arguing it. I'll defend it, but arguing it, forget it. It's a worthless venture. That Word of God, that Bible, all the wonderful, beautiful letters that were written by man, inspired 100% by the Holy Spirit, is for us. For us to get closer to the one who we should be focusing on, and that is Jesus Christ. Some of you are confused, as I am, and would ask, Albert, should we not see ourselves as a sinner? You should, but your primary focus should not be on the fact that you are, that you, that you are a sinner, but that you have a Savior and a Lord. See, over 300 times the Bible speaks of, people's, speaks of people as sinners. As I told you, more than 600 times it speaks of the wrath of God, and the wrath of God is for sinners. And some would say, 
I'm really not experiencing the wrath of God in my life. Everything is going hunky-dory. I'm, I'm, I'm prospering. Everything is wonderful in my life. Remember one thing. Romans 2, Paul states, storing up wrath. You see, it's like there's a dam. And behind that dam is the wrath of God is backing up. And on the day of your death, you will be flooded with the wrath of God and the conscious eternal torment of hell forever. There is no getting away from that. Except for one thing. In Christ. If Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, if your identity is in Christ, if you believe and trust and accept who Christ is and what he's accomplished for you, the wrath of God is removed from you. You see, the people who refuse, who deny Jesus who he is, they're not getting away with anything. They're just stacking up everything. However, when it comes to a Christian, when it comes to the believer, when it comes to the one who is positionally in Christ, only maybe three times does the Bible refer to us insofar as our identity goes as sinner. And those three occasions can be debated, highly debated. It is entirely possible that those three occasions are referring to not even to the Christians, but to the non-Christian. So when you really study the when you really study scripture, everything that pertains to sinners normally is referring to someone who is a non-believer. So my point the Bible does not primarily speak of you if you are a Christian with an identity as sinner. The Bible sees those who are not in Christ positionally as sinner. They see them, like we talked about several weeks ago, that God sees them as living in Adam, not living in Christ. And for those who are in Christ positionally as saint. Because when you meet Jesus, everything changes. You receive a new nature. Paul says everywhere to the, uh, to the Corinthians, you become a new creation in Christ. That old things have passed away and all things have become new. So here's the good news. If you're in Christ, you're not just a guilty, wicked, vile sinner who's forgiven. You see, you're a new creation in Christ with a new identity and a new biography and a new eternity. All things have become new. Some of you might say, I don't feel that. That's why you have to believe that. You see, once we believe that God has said, we start to feel as God feels towards us. Now, I'll give you some ways of seeing this. Sin may explain some of your activity. Does not define your entire identity in Christ. You will sin some of the time, but you are a saint all the time in Christ. Sin is some of what you do, but not the totality of who you are in Christ. You see, there is a difference between being sin and having sin. However, because you have a new identity as a saint, you can have a new victory over sin in Christ. As a sinner, you have a dark past, but as a saint, you have a bright future in Christ. So some of you are stuck, or are, are, are stuck because your primary identity is in your sin and not in your Savior Lord. You see, you're unable to move beyond your past because of shame and guilt and conviction and condemnation. God has forgiven you. If you are in Christ for, for things that you would say to, at, to this point, I just can't forgive myself, which sounds cute, but it's blasphemous. Because if, you're, if what you're saying is, God forgives me, but I can't forgive myself, what you're actually saying is, there's a God above Jesus with my name. And though the lesser God, lower God, named Jesus forgives me, 
the higher, greater God with my last name cannot. If you know in your heart that God forgives you, but for whatever reason you can't get past forgiving yourself, you've made yourself greater than God. You've put yourself in a position that is above God, that is above Christ, that's above Jesus, basically, and saying, He's forgiven me, but I can't forgive myself, which is blasphemous. And I've ran into many, 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 many people that are like that. I've ran into people that have made this comment pure, and I'm not even, I'm not even exaggerating on this. I can't be forgiven. My sin is too great. I look at him and say, you've made yourself an idol, you've made yourself God. Because there's nothing, there's nothing that God can never forgive. I shouldn't say never, I mean nothing, I, I use the wrong words. There's only one sin that God can, can't forgive, and that's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. What is that? Refusing him. So when, you, when you've accepted Jesus, when you've accepted him, what sin is there that he cannot, cannot forgive? Nothing. Some of you have wrongly thought that if you will obsess over your sin more, God will be more pleased with you. Have you ever met, I, I, I honestly, I've never met one of these individuals, and I'm okay if God so desires that I meet one, I pray he gives me the words and, and the love and understanding and the compassion. But there are people out there that hurt themselves believing that their sin demands some type of payment to get closer to God. And not that God is already, not that Jesus is already paid, they have to pay it themselves. So they start hurting themselves, they'll cut themselves, they'll beat themselves, they'll, they'll, they'll harm their physical. Some of you have taken your sin on as your primary identity. And the only difference you would see between a Christian and a non-Christian is a non-Christian is a guilty, evil, vile, wicked sinner. And a Christian is a guilty, evil, vile, wicked sinner who's forgiven. No difference in who you are. No change in your nature. No alteration in your identity whatsoever. That the Christian and the non-Christian are the same. And the only difference is one is forgiven, the other is not. But neither are changed. See, in Christ, one theologian says this. We are genuinely new, though not completely new. You see, you are genuinely new, and through the course of your life, there's something called Progressive sanctification, where in Christ you're growing and learning and changing by the power of the Holy Spirit. Until one day, you're in the eternal resurrected state, sin is gone, and you are with Jesus. And then you will be totally new. But let me say, the moment you receive Christ is the moment you become genuinely new. And you're on the path to becoming totally new forever. When Paul writes his letter to the Corinthians, and he's explaining, once you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, all things, he doesn't say some things, he doesn't say it's a progression, he doesn't say that one day you're old and then one day you're new in Christ. When you're in Christ, all things, all things are passed away. You are a new creation. And all old things passed away. But we like to take that and expound upon that in a way that makes it make us feel better when we sin. We like to say, well, you know, I am a work in progress. You know, you might have a t-shirt that has a wrecking ball. It, it says, Jesus is, is working on me daily. Is that true? Absolutely. I'm not arguing that. But in some way, we've made it to where we believe that some type of progressive sanctification 
needs to take place. Now, I believe that we do, in, that we increase in Christ on a daily basis. I believe that there is some level of precept upon precept, of knowledge upon knowledge. The more we study, the more we understand who God is, the more we know who God is, the more we know who we are, the more we know what we need to do because we find out more about our identity. I believe that. I know that. But I don't believe, and I'm going to say this, it's going to be out there. I don't believe that there is something that needs to, how do I want to say it? I want to make sure I spell this out correctly. I'm going to use this as an example. I'll use Paul as an example. Paul was a vile individual. Paul wanted to demolish and wipe out the Christian church. Killed as many as he possibly could. Murdered as many as he possibly could. He encounters Jesus Christ on the road of Damascus. That encounter changed him immediately. He didn't have to have laying on of hands for some type of um, uh, some type of uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, I'll use change. He, he didn't have to go through some uh, some man-made. I'll use that term. He didn't have to go through some man-made spiritual aspect of taking. Uh, the Jericho march to transform him. What transformed him was his encounter with Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what transformed him in an instant. And do I think that that's possible today? 100% I believe that. 100%. I think we muddled that up some by influencing certain things in the church, by skewing some things. I believe in a total transformation at the acceptance of Jesus Christ happening right then and there. I believe that. But I also believe there are people that accept Jesus Christ and they also have this these steps, these growing experiences that change them as life goes on. Now, how does that work? My name's Elbert. My name's not Jesus. And even if it was Jesus, I am not the one that was on that cross. I am not the one that defeated death. I am not the Savior of the world. So I leave all of that up to him. He is God, and he knows what he's doing. I don't need to be in charge. I don't want to be in charge. He can do everything. So he reconciles all of that. And I'm telling you this because if you don't understand this, you will have a false view of the good news of the gospel of Jesus. And that is, give your sin to Jesus and you go to heaven when you die. And there's no help in the meantime. Give your sin to Jesus, receive a new identity in Christ, and start to live a new life in Christ, and then enjoy a new eternity with Christ. This also changes the way we interact with one another. If you're dealing with a brother and sister in Christ, you need to remind them of who they are. When they're sinning, you need to say, you don't have to continue to choose sin. You see, in Christ, you're a saint. Which we don't do in the church. We don't call people out in the church. That's not my responsibility. That's the pastor's responsibility. That's the elder's responsibility. Wrong. That's every single person in this church. Every single person that is part of 
the church, the body of Christ. That is their responsibility to see another brother and sister and making sure that we keep each other in check. That is our responsibility. We fail miserably. That's why the world can look at us and say, well, you're not doing anything different than we are. The Bible says in Hebrews 4 that Jesus was tempted in every way as we are. Yet without sin, how did he do? How, how, did, it, how did the Lord Jesus resist all sin and temptation? How did he say no every time? You look at four, you look at places like Luke 4 and Matthew 4 where Satan comes. And let's just say that our temptation is not as severe as Jesus. That he was in the wilderness fasting for 40 days, 40 nights. He's hungry, he's isolated, he's tired. And let me say that the enemy will hit you when you're hungry, isolated, and tired. That's why they always tell you, never make a decision, halt. Always use the term halt. If you're hungry, if you're angry, if you're um, lonely and tired. Okay? If you have any of those feelings, hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, don't make a decision. And that's when he comes to Jesus. This is when Satan comes to Jesus. And what's interesting is when he tempts the Lord Jesus, he speaks to his identity. He says, if you are the Son of God, you see, that's a question. See, under all temptation is a question of identity. If you are the Son of God, what, is, what does Jesus say? You shall not tempt. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. You see, Satan comes to Jesus and the temptation is, I want you to question your identity. Jesus says, I will not give in sin because I know who I am. I am the Lord your God. I've asked people this before. How did Jesus overcome his sin? Well, he knew who he was. What's our excuse? We have no excuse. People don't like that. Just to let you know, they kind of rear up a little bit. See, Jesus knows who he is. Jesus, because Jesus knows who he is, he knows what to do. Once you know who you are in Christ, you'll know what to do for Christ. Once you know who you are in Christ, you'll know what to do with Christ. Once you know who you are, you'll know what life looks like in Christ. And I just want to ask you, do you see that? Does that make any sense? See, if your primary identity is as sinner, and then you are tempted to sin, your identity will determine your activity. I'm a sinner. I guess I'm going to sin. No, I'm a saint. I don't have to. I'm a new creation. I don't have to go back to the old ways. I'm genuinely new, and that means that the decisions that I make and the ways that I live, they're new in Christ. Amen? So when temptation comes, is temptation to sin? No. Remember, a bird can fly over your head. There's no bad thing about that. But you could stop the bird from making a nest in your hair. Do not entertain the temptation. Temptation is not the sin. Entertaining it. And if you actually come to the identity, come to the point in your life where your identity is solidified in Christ, you can look at sin and say, that's who I used to be. I'm not that individual anymore. I am a new creation. I have different outlooks on life. I have different, in, in, in different decisions to make because Christ lives through me. It's his life, not mine. So this is what I want you to know. I don't want you to get stuck in the trap of I can't change or I can I can I can change myself. Instead, I want you to know I can change in Christ. I can resist temptation in Christ. I can be obedient in Christ because I am personally righteous in Christ. 
I can start, I can start to live more practically righteous out of the righteousness that I find in Christ. So this is the one thing that can change everything for you. And for those of you who are what we call navel gazers and self condemners and those who think that the worse you feel, the holier you are, it's time to look up and out and to not just see your sin, but see your Savior, your Lord, and see yourself as a saint in Christ. And let me say this, a saint is remorseful over sin. I want to unpack this for you real quick. Paul elsewhere talks about, elsewhere in the scriptures, talks about his own sin. He, he does. Philippians 2. He talks about his own sin. He talks about the things that he has remorse for in his life. Chief of sinners, persecutor of the church. He's remorseful. Now, some of you are like tender conscience. You're tender hearted. If somebody points out a sin in your life, you receive it. You're devastated by it. You grieve it. And you hate it. And you want to change it. Your tender conscience. Some of you are like that. The Lord doesn't need you to yell at you. The Lord doesn't need to yell at you. He whispers, and that's good. He doesn't need to push you. He just needs to show you that the direction to go, and that's where you want to go. Now, my fear is for those of you who have a tender conscience. You will not understand what it means that a saint is remorseful. And so I want you to, I want to show you the difference between conviction and condemnation. You see, conviction is from God, but condemnation is from Satan. Conviction leads to life, but condemnation leads to despair. Conviction ends in joy. Condemnation ends in sorrow. Conviction makes you want to change. Condemnation makes you believe we can't change. Conviction leads to a new identity in Christ, while condemnation leads to an old identity in sin. Conviction brings specific awareness of a sin. Condemnation brings vague uncertainty about sin. Conviction looks to Jesus when condemnation looks to self. And conviction is a blessing and condemnation is a burden. So Paul state starts by saying this, grace and peace to you from God our Father. And I want you to see the difference between the conviction and condemnation is really the difference the difference between the character of God the Father and the character of Satan, his enemy and our adversary. Satan wants your identity to be in your sin. He wants you to never be able to leave it or escape it. He wants you to have no hope for your future. He wants to shame you. He wants to remind you and he wants to condemn you and he wants you to destroy you. He wants the worst day of your life to be the defining aspect of every day of your life. Have you ever had that? Have you ever sinned in your life and thought, this is who I am. This is going to be me for the rest of my life. You are in perfect position for Satan to work through you. Sometimes if you're not doing anything wrong, He'll just want to give you general, vague, uncertain conviction. It's really condemnation masquerading as conviction. Some of you will feel that God is far and he's angry against you. I, I, I've been here. I have been here. And he hates you. And he's mad at you. And he's just waiting to drop a hammer on your head. You're just waiting for him to drop a hammer on your head. And you're not sure what you've done so you become obsessed and you start investigating your life. Where are my idols? Where's my sin? What have I done wrong? 
And what are my what are my motives? And I can't find anything big. Maybe it's something small. And you obsess. And you become worried. And you become anxious. And you become discouraged. And God seems far. And you seem hopeless. And for those of you with tender consciences, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You become like the Old Testament Jews who are trying to cleanse their house. They try to go through their house. They're looking under the rug. They're looking under the lamp. They're looking under the bed. And they're dusting out the corners. And they're trying to get it all clean. You're like that with your life. And it seems holy. It seems righteous because you're talking about your sin. And how awful you are. And how evil you are. And all the bad things you've done. And, you're, and you'll share your story. And you'll talk how, how terrible you feel. And others will applaud you and how brave and authentic you are. But it's still all the attention to you. All of the focus to you. And everybody's looking at you. Nobody's looking at you. And him. Nobody's looking at Jesus. You see, God is a father. He's a father who comes up to his kid, his children, who is in sin and says, okay, first, let me specifically name the sin. So you know exactly what I'm talking about. Just not going to yell at you in general and make you figure it out. You put your arm around you. I love you. You're my child. This is not acceptable. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to help you. We're going to stop this, okay? We're going to do it together. Now, this is the dad who smiles at you, gives you a kiss on the head, and keeps his arm around you as he's helping you walk away from the sin and temptation. You see, God's like a father like that. You see, when he points out sin, it's conviction. Like, really, Dad? Thanks. I appreciate the help. You love me. So that doesn't cause me to be kicked out of the family. Oh, and you're not done with me yet? You love me? You're going to help me? And you're here for me? And see that I am going to be and see that I'm going to be is not who I've been. And you're going to help me get there. Wow, what a dad. That's your father in heaven. You see, conviction is different than condemnation. And I need you to understand that. Do you understand the difference? Conviction is different than condemnation. Jesus said he would send the Holy Spirit to convict God's people of sin. Paul says in Romans 8.1, there is now no condemnation for those who are, what? In Christ. Jesus tells us that believers will, be, will get conviction. And Paul tells us that believers will not get condemnation. So, a saint is remorseful over sin. A saint is someone who does not look at their sin and when they get caught say, dang it, I got caught. And then make it look remorseful. I've seen that. So saying is remorseful over sin. You can look back and say, boy, that was sin. And I'm really grieved that that was what I, that that was what I said or did or failed to say or do. Paul does. He says he's the chief of sinners and a hypocrite. And he's very clear elsewhere about his own sin. You see, it may explain some of what he does, but it doesn't define who he is. A saint is powerful over sin. And that's something that we need to grab a hold of. This is another thing that helps us explain who we because a saint has power over sin. Why? Because we're in Christ. 
I know we're only hammering two verses today, but they're good verses, aren't they? To the saints, now when you're dealing with a believer, remind them who they are. To the saints who are in emphasis and are faithful in Christ Jesus. How many of you would not say that? Faithful. How many of you would, would not say, hi, I'm a saint and faithful? Because immediately people would start asking questions. How much do you tithe? Oh, not enough. How many verses have you memorized? Very few. How many sandwiches have you made for the poor? I, I ate all the sandwiches. <laughs> Not been super faithful. Do you want to be faithful? Saints want to be faithful. Because God is faithful to us. We want to be faithful to Him. That's why the Bible says, even when we're faithless, He is faithful. So how are you going to be faithful to God who's faithful to you? How are you going to try harder? Are you going to try harder? Are you going to feel worse? No. Because he tells us grace. You see, that's a powerful word. That's an important word. One of the best words ever. Grace. Grace to you in peace. Now, if you're not a Christian... Let me be clear. You have no peace with God. You are a sinner and you need a Lord and Savior. You're living in the path of the wrath of God. You're storing up wrath for the day of judgment. You may not believe in hell, but you will. Let me be clear. Let me not preach peace where there is no peace. You need Jesus Christ and you need him right now. For those who are in Christ, peace. Doesn't that sound good? Because the entire wrath was poured out on Jesus. And all the blessings poured out on us. You see, that's where the substitutionary servant is that Isaiah talks about. The substitutionary servant. Jesus substituted himself for us. All the wrath, all the condemnation, all the conviction, all, uh, all the condemnation, all the, all the wrath, all the death, and all the punishment went upon him. What did we receive? All the blessing, all the forgiveness, all the grace and mercy. How, what an unfair trade. But yet, it was only because of his love for us that he did that. God is not angry with those who are in Christ. He's very loving and compassionate. In fact, not only does he have peace with us, he gives grace to us, grace to forgive us when we sin, grace to change who we are, and grace to empower us to live a new life. You know how you can be faithful? By the grace of God. See, Christians tend to think of the saving grace of God. There's also the empowering grace of God. The saving grace of God forgives all the sins that we have committed. But the empowering grace of God helps us to stop committing those sins. And it's a wonderful thing. That's the presence and the person and the power of the Holy Spirit at work in the life of the believer. Deep down, they say, I want to be faithful. Just like the man who looked at Jesus and said, help my faithfulness. Help me increase in my faith. And here's how theologians would explain all of this. They would say that the indicatives precede the imperatives. Here's how I would simplify that. Who you are determines what you do. You see, we don't start with read your Bible, pray, serve, give. We start with Jesus. I'll say it again. We start with Jesus. He's perfect for those who are imperfect. He's faithful to the, for those who are unfaithful. He's righteous for those who are unrighteous. 
Do you see who he is? Do you see what he's done? Do you see who he has made you to be in Christ and the grace that he's given you to live out of that new identity? The reason we give is because God so loved the world that he gave his only son. The reason we serve is because God serves us. The reason that we forgive others is because in Christ, God has forgiven us. The reason that we are poor, that we pour ourselves out is because our great God, Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, poured himself out for us. You see, so... What we do is not so that God would love us, but because in Christ, he has. It's not so that we would achieve an identity. It's because we've received one in Christ. It's not so that God would be pleased with us. It's because we're so pleased to be in Christ. You see, this makes life a blessing and not a burden. This is life lived in light of our identity in Christ. And that means that we get the joy and he gets the glory and others get the good. Now I want to put out a caveat if I could please. Just because you're in Christ doesn't give you the right to sin at will. It doesn't give you the right to go about your business sinning and saying, oh, I'm in Christ. No. Because I will state what Paul states in Romans. Just because grace abounds, does that mean sin abounds? No, 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 no. God forbid this isn't some type of, I have the right to sin card. This is, my identity is in Christ. And because Christ is faithful, I want to be faithful. Because Christ forgives me, I forgive others. Because Christ has accomplished so much for my salvation and my freedom and defeated death through resurrection that I want to be faithful to him and be the best person I can for him by the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome through him what he's accomplished, and that is he defeated sin. So that drives me, that helps me propel my life by the power of the Holy Spirit that my identity in Christ is to not want to sin. Because that's an old individual. That's an old identity. My new identity makes me stronger. Makes me see things different. Let's pray. Father, I truly pray that we can go forth changed, totally changed, totally transformed with a new Identity with a new revelation, a new, uh, a deeper illumination and revelation of who we are in you, so that we can go forth proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ, whoever we encounter, helping those who are not Christians, helping those who are living in darkness, showing them who you truly are to us, and for those who claim to be Christians, for those who claim to be brothers and sisters, helping them understand who they are in you. As we, as our iron sharpens iron, we keep each other in check so that the body of Christ would go forth with the power of the Holy Spirit, wanting to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ because that's what you did. That's what your disciples do, because they understood their identity in you. We want to give you all the glory and praise and thanks for what you've done for us. And please forgive us, Father, for doing things our way. Please forgive us when we do things 
the man-made way. You call us saints. You call us, you, you, you've placed grace and mercy on our life. We truly pray we don't take advantage of that. Keep us humble. Keep us firm in you. To glorify you in all things in Jesus.